Many of you know Ray Leonardson. Ray has been a fixture around Lakeside since really Lakeside got started. Ray, Ray serves as an elder here. And one of the things you may or may not know about Ray is Ray has a legendary sweet tooth. Uh, one of our recent elder meetings, he brought those little orange slices that are coated in the sugar coating. And if real fruits and vegetables tasted like that, I would probably be a vegan and never, uh, never look back. Unfortunately, they don't. But Ray is constantly hooking me up with, uh, with desserts and, and treats. And so I just wanted to repay the favor. So would you please welcome Ray? Come on, give, give Ray a warm welcome. Ray, I, I know your love of sweets. Yes. And so I brought you some jelly beans. All right. So if you would just dive in there and ha eat some jelly beans. and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have enough for everyone. Um, but if you would just share with us. This looks like cinnamon. What are you getting? I want this to be like a wine tasting, allow the, allow the flavors to really permeate the palate. Maybe a little peach? Oh, peach? Great, see? There's nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. Get back in there. I'm here for you, Ray. I know that. That's what scares me. No. <laughs> Don't be scared. Oh. <laughs> you got a Kleenex? No. <laughs> what? We're not going to spit out food in front of everybody. That wouldn't... What? <laughs> What? It's a jelly bean. Am I allowed to say what it tastes like? Yes. <laughs> Not that I'm an expert, but it reminds me of vomit. <laughs> Would you like another? Are you kidding me? <laughs> you don't have to. Okay, we'll try this one. All right. Oh, be a good one. They're all good. They're jelly beans. That was terrible. You're going to vomit on stage. <laughs> Be a good one. <laughs> this is a trick bag. Give it up for Ray Leonardson, everybody. Don't forget your jelly beans. Oh, Ryan, I'll remember this. <laughs> oh. Now, we may have just played a little game with Ray. And... Uh, his choices were either coconut or spoiled milk, uh, caramel corn or moldy cheese, chocolate pudding or canned dog food. I think that's the last one he got. Uh, buttered popcorn or rotten eggs, uh, juicy pear or perhaps a booger, um, <laughs> strawberry banana smoothie or a dead fish, Berry blue or toothpaste, lime or lawn clippings, tutti fruity or stinky socks, or peach or barf. So those were the choices uh, that, that we just gave Ray. And if you too would like to try your luck, I'm sure Ray would be willing to share with you. <laughs> He's got an entire bag full. He's got an entire bag full. So this is a game called Bamboozled, and it's, it's presented by Jelly Belly. Now, why in the world do we do this? Why, why, why we have Ray come up and, and give him delicious-looking jelly beans, only to have him discover in the process that they're not always as appealing as they look. This morning, we're going to look at a part, of, a part of the Bible in Proverbs chapter 5 that was written by someone under the inspiration of God that God gave more wisdom than anybody else. His name was Solomon. And yet, Solomon's life ended very differently than you might suspect for somebody who God gave more wisdom than anyone else. And we're going to peel back the curtain today and we're going to see, from Solomon's perspective, some things that should apply to all of us and some warnings that we all need to keep at the forefront of our minds. So if you have your Bible apps, you can follow along there. 
on your phones or your tablets, and if not, the verses will be on the screens where we read these words. My son, be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding, that you may keep discretion, and your lips may guard knowledge. He's saying, son, listen, pay attention. This is really important. Pay attention, listen, be wise in your conduct. Be wise and act wise. Don't just have the wisdom, but also act upon it. Be wise and act wise. And why is this so important? Well, he continues. For the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword, Her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways wander. And she does not know it. This is the deal. This is always the deal with adultery. This is always the deal with adultery. It always looks good at first. Her lips drip honey. It always looks good at first, especially if you find yourself in a marriage that you've been committed to for a really long time and you and your spouse have lost that spark, you've, you've, you're well past the state where it's fun anymore and now it is part of the grind. And this is where the rubber meets the road and this is where the vows get real. But gone is the spark. It's gone. It's, it's, no, it's well past. And you're really familiar with one another, and you've just gotten to the point where you're not even engaging each other sexually. And there's nothing going on, and you're distant, and you're not connected. And then all of a sudden, you see someone else, and the first look captures you. And her lips, they look as though they drip honey. It looks appealing. It looks like you will find that adventure once again. You will find that spark that's been missing in your life. You will discover a sense of adventure that has been long gone. You will once again have fun. It always looks good. It always looks appealing. And yet the path always, every single time, leads to destruction. Every time it looks good on its face, and every time it ends up in the same place. Destruction. Every single time. And we've seen this played out on a very public scale in just the last couple weeks. As it's been all over tabloids and news media, the divorce of Amazon founder Jeff Bezos and his wife, the tapes that have been revealed that private conversations between two adults that have now been splashed for all the world to read. And if you're like, well, that's why I just never got married. Don't think, don't think that this idea that you're just not married so none of these principles apply to you. We've seen that in just the last week as well with the news of Robert Kraft being accused of crimes. Sexual sin always, always, always looks appealing. It always looks fun. It always looks inviting. It always looks like it's going to be an adventure. And at first it is. Or else no one would do it. But the path is always the same. And it always leads to destruction. So I'm talking to you today, and I want you to understand this isn't from me, because I wouldn't expect you to listen to me. But this is the truth that God's word reveals to us, and we see it over and over and over again. 
And so you feel like you're trapped in your sexless marriage, and you're like, I just, I need to, I need to do something. You've, you've recently had kids, and you haven't been intimate, and you can't think of how long, and all of a sudden, the gaze of somebody else is, is looking rather good. Your husband no longer pays attention to you, and all of a sudden, your coworker is sending you texts and messages that don't just revolve around work anymore, and all of a sudden, it feels fun, and it feels exciting to get those messages and to respond back. It feels good to be wanted again always feels good and yet the end point is always the same it's destruction and now O sons listen to me and do not depart from the words of my mouth keep your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless Lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And at the end of your life, you groan when your flesh and body are consumed. And you say, how I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. And he's saying, when you find yourself thinking it's going to be appealing. When you find yourself in that situation where gone is just that friendship boundary and now it's crossed over into you're flirting with somebody else and you're in dangerous territory. When you find yourself crossed over into an inappropriate sexual relationship, which the Bible defines as any sexual relationship outside of marriage. When you find yourself in this dynamic, stay away, run away, stay away from her house, don't go near her. And yet that's incredibly difficult. Not just because it feels good, but because it looks good. So let's just be honest. God has designed us and wired us as sexual beings. That is wired into our DNA. God is the one who has given us sexual desires. And as with anything else, those things can get out of balance and those things can be perverted. But sexual desire is a gift to us from God. So attraction is natural. Attraction is natural. And here's where this gets really difficult. There is more than one beautiful person in the world. I remember when I was growing up, I, one of the goals that I had for myself, and this was a very humble goal, was I was going to marry the most beautiful woman in the world. <laughs> Incredibly humble goal, totally attainable for me. And that was, that was one of my goals, <laughs> that I was going to marry the most beautiful woman in the world. And I believe I did. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. The second most beautiful woman in the world is quite beautiful as well. And so is the third. And so is the fourth. And so is the fifth. And so if you convince yourself that if I just marry someone beautiful, that will take care of this problem forever. You're fooling yourself. Falling in love is incredibly easy. It's incredibly easy. And that doesn't mean that there aren't, aren't going to be things that you have to work through. And that doesn't mean that every step of the way you're going to feel like you're on, on a reality show and everything's going to be great. But falling in love is incredibly easy. Staying in love is incredibly difficult. It's incredibly hard. Relationships are hard. They're hard work. And if you are just counting on, if you're just counting on acting upon your feelings and thinking that's going to be enough to get you by in your relationships and for you to have 
a, a sexual relationship that you're completely fulfilled in, if you're just going to act upon what you feel, you are going to be disappointed and your, late, your relationship is going to fall apart. You cannot rely upon your feelings. You have to work your way toward a feeling. And honestly, there are times where we would just say, I'd rather not. I'd rather not today because it's really hard work. And there are times where we say, I would just rather not put in the work today. I would rather not do this. I would, I would rather just be able to act upon what feels natural. And yet, what we've seen in history, what we've seen in our news of, of today, what we've seen amongst our friends Maybe even sadly what some of us have seen in our own lives is when we do that, we set ourselves up for disaster and we go down a path we will always, always, always regret. It always looks appealing at first and it always ends in destruction. And it always will cost you more than you ever think it will. Physically, emotionally, and definitely spiritually. Drink water from your own cistern. Flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets... Let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. So here we're talking about be wary. Be wary of, of infidelity. Be wary of adultery. Be wary of the one that looks appealing and looks promising. And then all of a sudden we introduce this idea of drinking water from our own cistern, our flowing well. Basically what Solomon's saying here is be sexually active with your spouse. Drink water from your own cistern. Your sexual relationships need to be exclusive. They need to be exclusive with your spouse. This is God's design. That sex is something that happens privately and it happens exclusively within the confines of marriage. Be sexually active with your spouse. Flowing water. Flowing water from your own well. It's not just that you have a well, but flowing water from your own well. This is to be one of the defining points of your relationship together. That there is sexual intimacy. And it happens frequently. Flowing water from your own well. Yeah, keep it going. <laughs> Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. It's to be exclusive. It's to be private. It's to be frequent. But it's to be exclusive and it's to be private. And so I'm just going to caution you, especially those of you who are dating, once you get married, do whatever you want. But those of you who are dating and you're in that position right now where you're in love and it feels good and they're like, just, just send me a couple pics and, and then I'll delete them. Don't. Just don't. Once you send the sex, it, it never goes away. Just don't. Now, once you're married, you want to sext each other, that's great. Just make sure there's a passcode on your phone that your kids don't know. Otherwise, that's going to be really disturbing for them, and that's going to be years of therapy. But if you're like, hey, let's send each other some photos, get your freak on. Who cares? But when you're, when you're dating, here's the thing. People who are really good people, when their hearts are broken, can make really bad choices. And they can act impulsively. And they can do things that if they had a clear mind, they would, they would normally never do. But because there's disappointment, because there's hurt, 
They're not thinking clearly. And then that message or that picture that was private is now shared. And you never get that back. So if you find yourself in a relationship with somebody who's pressuring you to, to do anything that you're not comfortable with or anything outside of God's design, then you need to talk about priorities and you need to have boundaries in place. And if they keep pushing you, understand this, they don't ultimately love you more than they love themselves. Because what they're saying is that my needs and my desires are more important than what you're comfortable with. And that is a giant red flag and a reason for you to end the relationship. Now, if you've, if you've got pictures of somebody else, don't, don't share them. If they've done you dirty, don't, don't rise to their level. Delete them and move on. Sex, every time it goes outside of this, it ends poorly. Keep sex private and exclusive and keep sex frequent within the marriage design. That is God's design. God didn't design sexless marriages, but he also didn't design our sex to be broadcast for everyone else either. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. A lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? Work at your relationships. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. Rejoice in the husband of your youth. Work at your relationships. Put in the work. It's so crazy. So many couples will put up with anything while they're dating and refuse to break up. And then as soon as they get married and hard times come, they're quick to get a divorce. It's backwards. When you're dating and there's all these red flags, you don't have to put it in. You don't have to just continue. You can end the relationship. When you make vows before God and others, till death do you part, that's the time you have to put in the work. And it's hard work. And if you're going to rejoice, if you're going to rejoice in the spouse of your youth, you're going to have to put in some hard work because there are going to be times where you can't stand each other. And those are the times that it requires you to be honest and to fight for your relationship and to refuse to give up. Work at your marriages. It is always worth the work. Don't be quick when there's trouble to run to the arms of another. Be drunk in love with your spouse. Be drunk in love with your spouse. Now, if you come from a real Baptist background, you're like, how dare he say that in church? Well, Solomon said it, all right? So take it up with God. Be drunk in love with your spouse. Be giddy. Have fun. Be excited. Be outrageous. Have the grandparents take the kids away for a weekend and get on with your bad self. Do whatever you want, but be drunk with your spouse. Find that love Find that joy, find that silliness, and find it in the arms of the one you made a vow before God and others to spend the rest of your life with. For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline. And because his great folly, 
he is led astray. If you stray, if you stray outside of these guidelines, if you find intimacy in the arms of another, always, 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 it will end poorly, and you will find yourself trapped. Always. Marriages go through cycles. Think back to when you were first dating. And you got your first kiss. The joy, the excitement, the butterflies, the euphoria that you felt, that somebody you liked liked you back, and and just that initial connection of how good that felt. And then after you're married for a while, you're like, have you brushed your teeth yet? <laughs> I'm good. It doesn't mean that you don't love your spouse. It just means you're at a different stage. There are times in marriage where everything is clicking and you are both clicking and you're firing on all cylinders and everything is easy. And if you find yourself in one of those periods of time, enjoy it and embrace it and don't bring up things just to start fights. Just enjoy it and embrace it because enough legitimate things will happen. But know this. That's not going to last forever. And you're going to wake up one day, or your spouse is going to wake up one day in a funk, in a mood. And that will come to a screeching halt. And then what, where you were operating with so much synergy and everybody on the same page and you could do no wrong and everything was great, now the reverse is true and you can do no right. And things that at one point in time they may have even thought were cute about you. They can't stand. And you feel the same way. And if you find yourself there, I want to caution you on a couple things. First, is do not go outside the confines of the marriage to find the intimacy that you're sorely lacking. It will not end well. And second, be honest and fight. Fight for your relationship. If you need to see somebody, go see somebody in terms of a counselor, not somebody else in terms of sex. If you need to, if you need to talk to somebody, talk to somebody. Whatever you need to do, fight for your relationship. And yet, here's the, here's the heartbreaking thing, is it takes two. It takes two. And sometimes one person feels that way. But it's only one in a relationship of two. We're going to talk about that next week, and we're going to talk about all those different dynamics. Before we get there, I want to challenge you today. Don't stray. If the magic's gone, be honest with your spouse. And just say, we need to spice this up a little bit. We need to go get some new lingerie. We need to get into a new cycle. We need to get the kids away for a couple of nights. We got to figure something out. But our well needs to flow, and it needs to flow frequently, and it's not flowing right now. It seems a little dry. And then within the confines of the marriage relationship, there is freedom. So talk to one another. Be honest. Be open. 
Strive to fulfill each other's needs. Elevate their needs before your own. And make a vow today that no matter how good it looks, and it may look good at first, it's always, always going to end in destruction. And it will never taste as good as it promises. And there will always be consequences to pay. And if you're like, well, what about me, Brian? It's too late. I've already made that mistake. God's grace is bigger than every sin. You confess that to God. And the grace of God can do incredible things. It may be too late for your relationship. isn't too late for God to work in you. That's the greatness of the God we serve. But if you haven't yet gone there, and I hope you haven't, and I'm saying whatever it takes, don't. Because you will regret it. God, I pray for the marriages of the people of Lakeside. I pray, God, that we would be people who are willing to put in the hard work. I pray, God, that we would be willing to fight for our relationships. I pray that we would put the needs of our spouse before our own. That we would elevate one another within the context of our marriages. And we would honor you in our sexuality. I pray, God, that we wouldn't believe the lies that are sold to us. I pray we wouldn't believe the first look that always says this is going to be sweet, but it never turns out that way. And so, God, I pray that your spirit at work within us would prevent us from making choices that would ruin our relationships, would prevent us from making choices that would ruin us. And, God, for those who've made choices they regret that your spirit would convey there is forgiveness and there is grace in Jesus. And God, you are greater than any sin. You are greater than any mistake. And you can redeem us from all we regret. Help us be wise. Help us fight for the right things. Help us refuse to believe the lies that we're constantly sold. We ask in your son, Jesus' name.